Bibles with me this morning and turn with me to 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, if you would. I'd like to use this chapter and this lesson not as a nagging type of lesson or teaching, but more as a kind of a, um, hey, how long has some of us been saved? Okay. Ask yourself that question. And where are you at today? Not last year, not last month, but today in this matter of spiritual growth. I hope each of you, if you've been paying any kind of attention at all in this class, I hope that the Lord has challenged your heart to ask yourselves the question, hey, where am I? Have I grown up since being saved or do I just reach a certain level in class? And I like to use elementary, middle school, high school, whatever, and I just kind of planed out. And I, I've read the Bible a couple times and, and I, I've been on visit, visitation a few times. I get to church occasionally in Sunday school and I've just kind of arrived. And I think you'll find if you look with me in 2 Peter chapter 1 this morning, let's read a few verses here. Ask yourself, this is kind of like a report card check. I probably have company this morning, but I've, I've, I, I kind of get into this mindset of, well, I've arrived. I, I've been in church for years. I've been in the Bible for years. I've, I've been blessed with the privilege of teaching. I've kind of got it figured out. Are you kidding me? Amen. About the time you think you've got it figured out, you get a question from left field, you'll be challenged at work, you'll be challenged at home, you'll be challenged in a way you never thought about. And God says, hey, you know what? We're not done yet in this matter of classroom training. Let's get back into the word of God. And let's get back into some things that you used to do and we used to communicate and discuss and talk about. And let's see if we can't pick it up a little bit and get back on the road and get going, amen, for the cause of Christ. So if you look with me in 2 Peter chapter 1 here, and look at these verses and kind of ask yourself this question, where am I in this matter? If, if God was grading me this morning, where am I? Have I made any progress since being saved? Second Peter chapter 1, verse number 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Look right off the bat, virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, temperance. To temperance, Patience and to patience, godliness, and the godliness, brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the folks out this morning. Thank you, Father, for the mothers. Thank you for blessing us with the privilege of being in your house this morning. God help us to redeem the time. Lord, may the lesson be personal this morning. May you help us to focus. Help us to remember, Father, who we serve and why we serve. And help us to, there's something in this lesson for me, for each person here this morning. May, Lord, we not just be hearers, but Lord, help us put into application the things that taught this morning. May your hand be upon this class, certainly the others. May, Lord, you do the teaching. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you back this lesson up just for a little bit here, this matter of besides this giving all diligence, folks, there is a certain amount of, of effort God expects out of each of us. Amen. If you think with me just for a minute here, God expects a certain amount of effort on our part if we're going to learn and grow for the cause of Christ. That matter of diligence, I'll just read a brief description here, is constant and earnest effort to accomplish what is undertaken. Persistent exertion of body and mind. It does take work. If you're blowing the dust off the Bible this morning, picking it up for church, you haven't been in it for several days, let me challenge you. God wants you in his word. God wants you thumbing through the pages and reading and praying and meditating over his word. It takes some effort because you're going to find that one of the first things God wants you to add to your faith here is virtue. Now, when I mention this matter, uh, characteristic of Christian virtue, what comes to mind? You don't have to answer, but just think with me. We're to add to our faith, and the first characteristic that God mentions here is virtue. Just think with me for a minute. I'm going to ask several questions this morning. No screaming or shouting out, amen, it's okay, but just think, virtue. I've got an ex a, a definition here, and think with me here for a minute here. It says, moral excellence, goodness, righteousness. Here's another conformity of one's life and conduct to moral and ethical principles 
uprightness. Look with me in Romans chapter 12, and it's a matter of conformity of one's life and conduct to moral and ethical principles. Romans chapter 12, first thing that comes to mind is, is, uh, is the Lord Jesus Christ were to be conformed to the image of his son. Like it or not, folks, we're being conformed to somebody or something today, even, okay? Uh, we're being conformed. I, I don't see any horse and buggies out there this morning. Amen. Right? We're being conformed, whether we like it or not. Um, style of dress, okay? Uh, what we drive, uh, where we eat, okay? We're being conformed. Well, no, no, we're not. Yes, we are. Now, here's the challenge that I'm faced personally each day is God wants me to be conformed to the image of his son, okay? Well, you think of everything you're barraged with each day and throughout the week. It is a challenge, is it not? Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies, look at carefully here, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's not an unreasonable request that God is asking each of us this morning that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And look with me in verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. We've gone through these verses before. How? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So like it or not, folks, you're being conformed throughout the week. Whether it's at work, whether it's at school, wherever you find yourself, there are things in, that are at work out there that are conforming our life. The challenge is to ask yourself the question is, am I being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ? Am I, am I making the effort we're supposed to be? Now look with me, enough, if you would please, in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Any of you rearing children... Uh, I grew up in a public school system for better or for worse, for richer, for poor, poor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Amen. It doesn't take long to see children slowly be conformed, were you with me this morning, to their environment or people they spend their time with, their kiddos they spend their time with. As parents, amen, those of you rearing children, you begin to pay more attention and you begin to listen and you begin to watch and observe, whoa, wait a minute. That company's not so good to have my children around, or that place isn't so good, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Amen? Adults, we've got to be the same way. You, you pay attention. You start, to, you start to become more attuned uh, to what's going on around you. You say, whoa, I don't need to go there. I don't need to listen to that. I don't need to read that. Well, how do you exist in this world? That's a whole other lesson. Amen? Look at the life of Daniel, et cetera. But look with me, in, if you would please, in First Peter chapter 1. In verse number 13, it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. This is 1 Peter 1, 13. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Why? Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, Folks, that's a challenge. On, on my best day of, of living a life that's pleasing to God, it is a challenge. But could I suggest and submit for your consideration, at least get up to the plate and take a swing with the bat. Amen? What was the key to Paul's life in this matter of, 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 of getting along and working and, and in, in the world around him? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. If you're challenged in an area this morning, God hasn't moved, amen? He's a very present help. If you're challenged, whether wherever God's placed you at, you're supposed to be salt and light, but perhaps things are a little more challenging than you thought it would be. Listen, I can do all things through Christ. That was the key to Paul's life. This matter of conformance, we're being conformed whether we like it or not. The challenge is, are we being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ? So if you're, if you're thinking with me this morning a little bit as we look at these verses, we're to add to our faith virtue and then to virtue knowledge. If you go with me to the book of Hosea chapter 4, the book of Hosea chapter 4, we're not hurting for knowledge this morning. Would you? Is that a fair statement to make, folks? This is the information age, is it not? Amen. We are bombarded. I, 
it was a, we were kidding each other the other day at work about how did we do this 30 years ago? I'm getting texts and they want a response in two minutes. And it's like, are you serious? Hello, are you out there? I get this, hello? You know, like, hello? And you, you want to, well, any smarties in here that like to retort with things on a... <laughs> Amen? Do you know in the old days, come, don't laugh, amen, in the old days, amen, you had to find a payphone, amen, as you're driving around, we, and you might have a pager, and things were a lot, but, but we are bombarded today. We are, I, amen, think those of you computer types and those of you who work on, that, that are really into your phones and things, look at the information in front of you this morning. No, don't, no, no, no not right now. Just think with me here, amen. Now, you can catch up on the score later or whatever, but listen, think with me. What's an, I, I can look at all the drawings on a project I'm on, amen? I can look at all the emails related to that project. I can look at all the information of who's on that project on and on and on. And on. It's right there on the, in the palm of my hand today. My dad is still baffled with it. My grandpa would just shake his head, amen? But we are information age. So when you look with me in the book of Hosea, chapter number four, if you look with me here, chapter number four, I'm going to read from verse one and roll into the, uh, a verse I'd like you to, to focus on this morning. But Hosea, chapter four, says, in verse one, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Why is that? Because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field, with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Yet let no man strive nor reprove another, for thy people are as they that strive with the priest. Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. My people, in verse 6, are destroyed, now look here, for lack of knowledge. Wow, what an indictment. Now this is, this is directed at Israel, okay? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now here's the question I want to ask you this morning. Lack of knowledge of what or who? Don't have to answer, but think with me. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. How to make money, how to be educated, how to work, how to, how to plant, how to harvest. What were they destroyed of? Why, why were they destroyed for lack of knowledge of what? Who or what? Look with me, if you would please, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 9. You look at America today, we're not hurting for lack of knowledge of in the education, in information technology. But look at me in Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse number 23 tells us, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, Look here, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. You look at America today, folks, we're not hurting for a lot of things. I don't remember the last time I missed a meal. Amen. I don't remember the last time I didn't have finances to put gas in the car. I don't remember the last time we couldn't jet off somewhere. Amen. For vacation or drive. I don't remember the last time that if I wanted an education in something, I could get it, whether it's online today or at, or at the local university. I mean, we are not hurting for information today. Is that, would you agree with me? But where is, what was the issue that God had with Israel? <laughs> no knowledge of God in the land. It's getting that way a little bit, amen, maybe a lot in America today. We are a blessed nation. But folks, here's my question to you as a Christian this morning. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge of who or what? God. Now, it ought not to be that way with God's people. Amen? 
But you have to ask yourself the follow-up question this, well, well, how do you get to know God? If you were to be asked the question at work, well, well, who's God? God today in America can be a hundred different things. But who's God? Knowledge, well, we're, we're destroyed for lack of knowledge, and I just read lack of knowledge of God. Well, well, how do you get to know God? Well, let's look at that here with me for a minute here. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Well, how, how, how do you get to, to understand and know God? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. And it says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid... It is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, comma, look carefully here, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded light shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. How do you get to know God? Get to know Jesus Christ. Now follow that scripture up with me in the book of Colossians, if you would please, chapter 1. You may be asked this someday, well, who's God? Why do I need to get to know God? How do I get to know God? Get to know Jesus Christ. In the book of Colossians, chapter 1, look at me in Colossians, chapter 1, verse 12. Colossians 1 verse 12 tells us, it says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Look here in verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. How do you get to know God? Get to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll find again in verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God. What man has seen God at any time and lived? Who made the request to see God? Was it Moses? Amen. Do you remember what God told Moses? I'll hide you. Come on, in the cleft of the rock. And I'll put my hand over you. Because no man's seen God at any time. What was he was protecting Moses from? The Shekinah glory. Yeah, the Shekinah glory. Think about that. Yeah. He would have been destroyed. But I'll let you see my back, he said. Just enough. Just a little glimpse. So how do you get to know God? Get to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Huh? Well, how do you get to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Look with me, if you would, please, in the book of John, chapter 1. Again, you may be asked this someday. And uh, sometimes I need to review this myself. Well, how do I know God? Well, I need to get to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how do I get to know the Lord Jesus Christ? In the book of John, chapter 1. In John 1, verse 1, it says... In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now if you look at me down in four, verse 14 of the same chapter, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who's being spoken about here in verse 14? Jesus Christ. Amen. How do you get to know God? Get to know Jesus Christ. Well, how do you get to know Jesus Christ? 
Oh, something about the word of God here connects the two. Christ and the word of God, the same thing. You could follow these verses up with me in Hebrews chapter 1. Look with me in the book of Hebrews chapter 1. My challenge to an unbeliever is rather than arguing about is there a God, is there a, a Jesus Christ, is you get in the Bible. Get, get, get past that obstacle with folks and, and challenge them. You get in the word of God. How do you get to know Jesus Christ? Get in the word of God. Challenge people to do that. I can argue all day, but the word of God is still quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I can argue the word of God cuts, it slices, it knows exactly which point, which part of the heart to deal with. Amen? How do you get to know Jesus Christ? Get into the word of God. In the book of Hebrews chapter 1, if you follow along here in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets... Look here in verse 2. Hath on these last days spoken unto us how? By his son. Amen? Yes. What do you have in your hands this morning? The word of God and Jesus Christ are one. How do you get to know Jesus Christ? Get into the word of God. Look with me in John chapter 5. John chapter 5. It's a challenge to Christians, folks. Get, get back into the word of God yourselves personally. John chapter 5. Well, why the Word of God, Brother Doug? What's wrong with a commentary book or a book about the Word of God? I've mentioned this before in this class. There's a, there's a ton of them out there, written by a whole lot more spiritual people than me. But God promised to bless his Word. Amen? And this is something you have to be careful of. It can stir my thinking. It can stir, stir questions. It can reinforce some thoughts with a lot of the other books. But, but I need to hear from the Lord. I need to get into the Word of God. If I want to change in my heart and life, it's not going to come from my own self-effort. That'll last for a little while. It's ultimately going to come from the Word of God. Now, working of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 5, verse number 39. Look at this verse here in John chapter 5, verse 39. What does, what does the challenge Christ is telling, or speaking to here? He says, search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. How do you get to know God? Get to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how do you get to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Get into the word of God. Now, here's the problem I mentioned at the start of this class. My problem is I know I'm saved. Fair? Okay. I know I'm saved. But there's times in my life where I've kind of got that I've arrived. I, I've got it. I've got it figured out. I've grown all I'm going to grow. Please. Amen. <laughs> Pray for me that that doesn't repeat itself too often. Look with me in the book of Philippians chapter 3, if you would, please. Sometimes we need to be rejuvenated, revived, however you want to put it, because we get to be, if we're not careful, like Samson who gets up, shakes himself as he did every other day, and wish not that God had departed from him. Now that's a tragedy, amen? But look with me in Philippians chapter 3, if you would please, verse 13. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Who's speaking here? It's all right. Paul, in these words, in the divine inspiration of God. This is Paul. Amen. Look, verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So here's my challenge this morning. We're probably about out of time. God wants us to add to our faith. Well, I don't feel like it. Ask God to help you with that, and he will. Amen? Well, I've arrived. No, I don't believe that. Paul hadn't in Philippians 3. Amen? But he was still pressing toward the mark. Sometimes we need to be remotivated, revived, rejuvenated, however you want to look at it. And I'll give you a hint, that, that's not going to typically come from yourself. Get back into the word of God, ask God to help you with it, ask God to help you not just to be a hearer, but a doer. This matter of adding to your faith, it's like a report card check, is it not? Because guess what we're going to look at right down the road here. If you go back with me to first... Uh, Second Peter chapter 1, 
<laughs> you have to almost smile the way God orders things. But 2 Peter chapter 1, find your place in 2 Peter 1. And what's the next thing mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 1 there? Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance. Oh, great. Amen. You mean I actually have to restrain myself? You mean I have to practice self-control? Amen. God wants his children to keep things under control. Because if you were to look at this matter of tempers, I put down a couple of thoughts here. I want you to listen carefully. Moderation or self-restraint in action, comma, <laughs> self-control. Amen? Any of you have self-control issues? God wants you to add to your faith not just virtue and knowledge, but temperance. You might think with me here just for a minute here, do you have anger management problems? If you drive anywhere in the state of Texas today, no. Austin, no, my neighborhood. Let's narrow it right down. Amen? I can't get out of the driveway some days without some issue with some I was going to say woman driver, that's not good, it's Mother's Day. But some other driver, it's never me. So if you have, I'll tell you what, we speak about this sometimes, but it is an amazing self-check about how much self-control or lack thereof that we have. It's, it's not a free-for-all out there. God wants his kiddos to behave themselves in spite of what's going on around them. So if you have anger management issues this morning, don't drive. But look with me here in Proverbs chapter 16. No, God has to remind me on a regular basis. Of, oh, so you think you're spiritual, huh? Good. Let's put that to the test right here at, at 7 this morning. So Proverbs chapter 16, if you would. Husbands and wives. What's it take to get your fuse lit up, husbands? Amen. Or wives with the husband. Oh, but I'm in perfect self-control. Are you? You don't answer, just <laughs> Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. Look what it says here. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. That's amazing. Huh? Well, I can't do that. Do you realize my circumstances and the people around me? Well, then I guess what does Philippians 4.13 speak to? I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I guess God's not able to help us with that, so let's just skip this one, right? No. Rather than skipping the lesson God has for you and just stepping over it or around it very carefully, and we'll get back to that sometime next year, God wants you to deal with it now, today. This lesson isn't by accident or because I know somebody out here has anger management issues and I'm going to drill them from the pulpit this morning. Amen? No. It's me, usually, amen, that God deals with first. And if the rest of you get a blessing from this, praise the Lord. But it goes on to say, again, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruled his spirit than he that taketh the city. And you could follow this up with me in Proverbs chapter 19. Look in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. This is a great verse here. I think of my heavenly father, Proverbs 19, 11. It tells us what? The discretion of a man deferreth his anger he puts it off it is his glory to pass over a transgression aren't you glad God does that with us huh that he defers his anger it's not immediately cataclysmic judgment when we step over a line sometimes God lets us know in a hurry but that verse is an amazing verse it says the discretion of man deferreth his anger and his glory to pass over a transgression speaking of anger we could go on to the tongue and maybe we'll do that next week but add to your faith virtue and a virtue, knowledge, and a knowledge, temperance. And we're out of time this morning. This time we would dismiss with a word of prayer. I trust the lesson has been a blessing to you. Father, thank you, uh, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of being here this morning. God, help to increase our knowledge of thee, Lord, particularly our knowledge of Christ, particularly being in your word. Lord, in the area of self-control, may you, you be our strength and help. Help us to make the effort, Lord, with your help, Father. 
May your hand be upon the service to follow. May Christ have the chief seat. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you to know and do his will this morning. God bless you each for being here today.